Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video, and feel free to check out any of my other uh, reviews, my Star Wars sequels reimagined, I reviewed Book of Boba Fett, I also have many other just general Star Wars insights, and feel free to check those out. Feel free to like and subscribe if you like the content, and let's get into this. So, this episode starts off on Coruscant, and we see glowy popsicle chick who framed science guy, who by now we know it's pretty clear she's an Imperial Mole with the useless new republic and she walks into an alleyway and there's an imperial probe droid that just i don't know i guess he's just hanging out on Coruscant under the new republic's nose in some alleyway he just chills there and then and that's how she's communicating with moff gideon his probe droid it's like so this is gideon's way of communicating to the moles on Coruscant with this probe droid hiding in an alleyway and you're like why wouldn't you just like disguise an r2 unit or something like just have a droid that looks like all the other droids on Coruscant and use that. No, we're going to have a probe droid <laughs> just so that you get that visual. Look at the probe droid. Anyway, and she updates, she updates Gideon on the pirates losing on Navarro. So now we find out the pirates were part of Gideon's plan. And I'm like, so Gideon thought using these dumb pirates was a good idea? Like, why would you use these idiots that just wanted beer <laughs> in a school? But whatever, I guess he's super smart. And so, Gideon is like, how could Bo-Katan and Mando have worked together to take out the pirates when their factions are sworn enemies? But, you know, like, the show never really gave us that feeling, like, other than the stupid helmet rule, like, you don't, there's no real background other than a few lines of dialogue, so it's like, I don't know, it was said, but the moment Mando was in trouble, Bo rushed to save him multiple times, and even in season two, it's not like they were, like, fighting all the time, they were kind of, I don't know, it just seemed... It just seems like that's kind of over, over blown than what we're actually seeing and getting from the show. But they're trying to make us believe that they have this big divide. I don't know. And they both helped Grogu. So this whole sworn enemies thing isn't really all fleshed out like it should be for us to really believe that. And so then Gideon hangs up the phone and walks down a hall with the force field things from Naboo and Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are fighting Maul. I guess they're just, they use those everywhere now. And even though they were sort of part of the Nubian system on Naboo, now it's like, Imperials are going to use those in their place. And it's like, okay, whatever. And then there's <laughs> some kind of robot stormtroopers guarding. And then we see it's a cloning facility, because again, we have to take hours and hours in a TV show to try to explain the stupidity of Palpatine's return, and Snoke's and Jars, and all that stuff, so we're gonna have, this is gonna be reoccurring, you know, it's gonna be everywhere, it's gonna be in Ahsoka, it's gonna be in everything, so that we can, you know, get this idea that they were working on stuff, so that Palpatine, and then he enters, and then he enters a room where a bunch of Imperial officers are chatting it up about a, the non-threat of the New Republic and how citizens are sick of the New Republic rules. And again, it's all to justify the nonsense of this constant Empire threat, and it's only been five years since the citizens cheered and tore down Palpatine statues. <clears throat> like, come on. So again, the OT did nothing. The Battle of Jakku and Endor didn't actually do anything, and there's still all these officers with ships and crap all over the place. Like, there's just too many. It doesn't make sense. And so, and yeah, what did Luke and Leia and Han and Chewie and Lando and all, well, they did nothing. It's pointless. You might as well have done nothing and just stayed home. And they talk about Thrawn coming back and it's like, and you've got these guys and you've got Thrawn and his massive fleet and citizens want the Empire to take over already. Anyway, it's just, uh... It just it gives you the feeling that the, the that Disney Star Wars is just basically they're just replacing the OT with their stuff, and then they're mixing in a bunch of you know EU stuff now because the movies were failures and the shows losing ratings and nobody really cares anymore and hardly anyone watched Andor and it's so now it's just like well what do we do? Quick, throw in some EU stuff that the forty year old men were reading back in the day and they're gonna get happy now because Thrawn. It's just that, you know, that's the motive. So it just ruins it. And then Buddy tells, or Gideon tells Buddy that Thrawn's so-called return is, is pretty much pie in the sky because we've been waiting all this time. And 
And then Hux's dad is like, <laughs> yes, they put Hux's dad. He's like, why are you doing cloning when that's my specialty to Gideon? Because he heard that he was doing some. And then, and then they have this thing where Pelion, who's supposed to be with Thrawn and Hux are getting, him and Hux are getting all the resources that the Shadow, this is called the Shadow whatever group or what the heck did he call it? The, the Shadow Council. This is the Imperial Shadow Council. And the rest of them are mad that Pelion and Hux are getting all the resources and not sharing the rest with them. Because there's some grand plan with Thrawn. And the rest want the resources shared. And Gideon needs more stuff. Because Gideon tells them the Mandalorians are going to retake Mandalore. And then Pelion's like, oh no, that will cause us problems. And I'm like, why? Why do you care? Like, why do you care? You have the th you have Thrawn's fleet. Your fleet. All eight or ten people in this room have stuff, some sort of fleets or whatever, whatever resources they have. But you're concerned that Mando's living in their pile of rubble? Like, who cares? You've killed almost all of them anyway. It's just like, why do you care? And then anyway, Gideon is going to get more stuff and try to take out the Mando's. And at the end, Gideon is spinning around like he's talking to all of them in the middle of the room. But I'm like, I'm thinking like, they just see this guy doing pirouettes in their holograms, like them looking at him and his hologram, like <laughs> just him spinning around like a, like a ballet dancer. And they're all like, "All hail the Empire!" They all say it, "All hail the Empire!" And it's like, why? Like, like who's the leader? Thrawn, that's not even there, and they're all just there. Like what? Like it's just it's weird. Like the Empire is about one guy running the show, not a a, a council. They're more, they're more a council than the New Republic is at this point. Like it's, it, But it's all about, oh, Thrawn's going to come. But he's not there, so typical baddies would be fighting each other. They wouldn't be like, yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll get together and we're going to get along. Even though we're the bad guys. Anyway, and then Bo's Mandos arrive at Navarro as people are trying to clean up the mess. And there's some good visuals. Like this, this episode had some really good visuals and stuff. And then Bo's group walks up to the Armorer's group. And one, one is straight up pimping with like all their ships and matching armor, and the other is just a bunch of ragtag bums. And I mean, it's like that's what you get for following the dumb armor. You guys could have been part of this awesome group with all this these resources and places to sleep inside, and you decided to follow the dumb armor. And then there's like this tension caused because Bo and her clan take off their helmets, and the homeless Mandos don't like it. And they're like, how dare you? And then, but before it gets heated, the armor clangs the Lord of the Flies conch, which is the hammer that she has. And she settles things down and she's like, we invite you to make camp. And I'm like, okay, lady, I'll go sleep in our massive starship. I'll meet you in the morning. <laughs> and then Carl Weather shows up and he gifts Mando some booze. And it's like more booze in Star Wars. You can't have an episode of Star Star Wars anymore without, without a booze reference. The same with Star Trek. They're doing the same thing. It's all about booze. And then, and then this is booze from Coruscant. You know, save it for a special occasion. And then he brings him and, and gifts him IG-11. But now he's... Now he <laughs> but now he's Mech Warrior IG for Grogu. Just like the rumor said. He's Mech Warrior Grogu. As if Rancor stopping most powerful force user of all time, Grogu, needs a mech suit. Like, he does not need a mech suit. It's an excuse for them to tie IG in again. When they... He was completely pointless. Those, the first episode was completely pointless. And then it's Babu fixed it, and he's controlling it from this kangaroo pouch that they installed on, the, on IG-11. So that's IG kangaroo pouch. Uh, and the driver can use it to talk now. There's like buttons for like yes and no. So so Grogu will talk through the Mech Warrior kangaroo pouch now. And then they put Gro Grogu in the pouch and Mando says he's too young for it. And Grogu's like, no, he keeps pushing the no button. So I guess his first actual word is no that we like word that we know he meant to say. As in like, no, I'm not, I, I'm not leaving. I like my mech suit. And then it's like, dude, he should have stayed with Luke. And I'll further that later. And in the end, Grogu keeps the suit. And he keeps hitting the yes button while they're walking around. Because he's a baby. But he's not a baby. Because he's the most powerful force user ever. But he is a baby. But he isn't. 
he's 50, but he is. And then, and then they walk through the market and Grogu's grabbing at everything and ends up squeezing a fruit on some merchant guy's face. <laughs> some fruit juice. And, and Mando has to pay the guy for all this food that Grogu's eating and grabbing and stuff. And then Bo gives the speech about taking back the pile of rubble that is Mandalore. And she's like, we'll have to move the fleet there and send a scout party down onto the surface. But I need a mix from both tribes. And so Mando volunteers and Grogu is going. And he's probably going to go in his mech warrior suit. And then pretty much all the Mandos from both sides that have had lines of dialogue in the show at this point volunteer to go down. And so they leave for Mandalore. To, to have the big war, I'm assuming, eventually with Gideon and fight the Mythosaur or whatever they're going to do with the Mythosaur. But obviously Gideon's going to get go there because what's your nuts informed him about the Mandos and then they land on the surface and they're heading down. And it comes to me again, it's like, how are they going to finance and employ the craftsmen necessary to rebuild this hole? I mean, honestly, the, the Helmet Clan are broke. They're bums. Even if Bo sold the entire fleet, it wouldn't be enough to rebuild any anything in this place. I don't know. Are they just going to enslave the clubbed cavemen? I just... It's like, we're fighting for Mandalore. That's nothing. It's just... To me, it's just, it's just kind of silly. And then... Some pirate ship-looking thing arrives, and Bo says, Night Owls! And they're like, Is that Bo-Katan? Do you have food? And it turns out there are also Mandos that take their helmets off. Like, take your helmets off, dumb helmet creed people. No one cares. No one else is doing it anymore. Move on. Take a breath of fresh air. Like, your your immune system's probably under a lot of stress because you're just breathing in your own air over and over and over. You're releasing carbon dioxide, just re-breathing it. You're going to get bronchitis. Why don't you just take your helmet off and take a breath of fresh air? And I guess these guys are survivors who were still on Mandalore, and they were like, we were made an example of because we wouldn't surrender like the Mandalorians and when they got destroyed, and Bo's like, no, I did surrender, and I gave Gideon the Darksaber in exchange for sparing the rest of the Mandos' lives. And Gideon betrayed her, and it's all a setup for the big battle of Gideon, and it turns out that Bo wasn't the, the meanie that they thought she was, so maybe she's okay to be our leader, and so now the Helmet Mandos see that Bo isn't just a cold-hearted meanie, so they trust her more. But Bo's all concerned she can't keep everyone together, and there's too much animosity. But it's like, I'm not invested in that whole thing, because it's so irrational and dumb. Why do a bunch of homeless people be like, we don't want to join with those people with all the resources and good stuff that we need, and they're just like us except for our helmets. We're going to be mad. It's like, there's nothing there. It's just, anyway. So... Then the armor takes the weakened pirates that needed food and were just couldn't fight or anything back to the fleet, and the rest go to find the forge on Mandalore with the big pirate ship. So basically, all the commanding officers are on the surface going to the forge while everyone else and the armor are out in space, so they can't communicate from the surface because of the magnetism or whatever. Remember from the previous episode. So if Gideon shows up, all their commanders can't help. Super smart strategy on Bo by Bo on this one and bring all the commanding officers down and then and then Buddy who Bo beat up to take over and the dad from the clan whose whose son was in the, the pterodactyl and got puked up have a squabble about the rules of Mando chess on the pirate ship and I'm like the animosity can't be that bad if they're willing to sit down and play a game together like that's just not if you really hated the other clan you wouldn't even be associating with them and then the dad is like, I beat you in the board game, so you need to submit or fight and say you lost the board game. I won Monopoly. And then this is basically as cringe as the pirates demanding booze in the school. Like, really, bro, you're going to fight over Monopoly. And so they fight over the chess game or whatever it is. It's just, uh, anyway, and then, then Grogu steps up with the IG and he pushes the no button at them. He's like, no, 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 no. And then they stop. They stop fighting. And this is right after Bo is like, neither side is allowed to step in, like either clan. And then it's like, but Grogu is a Mando for the helmet clan. But he doesn't have to wear a helmet because he's a baby. But he isn't, so it's okay. Like, he is and he isn't, so it's okay that he stepped in, I guess. 
I don't who knows at this point. And then right as the Mando pirate ship is passing through some area, a beast just happens to be coming up out of the ground. And it's another dino beast that smashes the boat with its big tail. I don't remember what those kind of dinosaurs were called. They had like plated backs and they had like this big tail with a big ball thing at the end. Like the, the, just like the story group said, it's going to be Dinoville. And then, and then it, it smashes their ship and they all run into the caves. And again, Classic Disney piss poor lighting again. He's, he's so <laughs> just thought I'd mention. So then they get to the Great Forge, which is in the heart of the dwarf. I mean, sorry, uh, the, the Mando civilization. And then they get ambushed by Gideon's droid stormtroopers. Or at least I thought they were them, but they're actually just normal dudes with jetpacks, stormtrooper guys. But and uh, and then they all have jetpacks. Yeah, so I guess they're they're like anti Mandos or like not Mandos. And they fight them, and the Imperials flee, and then the Mandos chase them, but there's an, there's this Imperial tunnel, and you're like, whoa, wait a second here, I guess Gideon has been here for a while or something, but the Forge isn't in operation, or or were the Mandos using Imperial architecture, and then it's like there's a full-blown Imperial base under there, and then the door closes. And actually, it's good that there's a base under there, because eventually they, they're going to retake Mandalore, and they have no way of building anything, so it's good that they have these, like... This infrastructure, thanks, Gideon. That's good because we don't have any way of rebuilding anything. So sweet. And then the door closes and separates Mando from the rest of the group. Like, like they close the blast door on the rest of them, so he gets captured and has to get saved by Bo again, probably in the next episode. <sighs> and then Gideon floats down with his jetpack and his horned helmet. So he's like the armor, but the anti-armor, the non-armor with his horned helmet. And he starts going off about he's going to create an army and bring order to the galaxy. And you're like, what? Like, the New Republic must be total idiots if this one guy on this one planet is that confident. Like, what is this? This is insane. Like, the Emperor took control through politics and stuff, but he had the control of the whole galaxy through that. Because he was given control by the Senate. You can't just, like, roll up with a Star Destroyer and be like, oh, I'm taking over the galaxy now. Nah. Oh, it's just, anyways, and then Bo and the other Mandos are stuck in a sealed room, and Gideon attacks the fleet, or he says he's going to attack the fleet, and then Bo cuts a hole in the door on the one side with the dark saber, and the Mandos run away, and then some big guy sacrifices himself for the team, you know, the big guy that Mando fought, and then he fought over the chess game, and and so he, he takes out the rest of the troopers with his big giant gun that, that burns out. And then, then, then the Praetorian guards show up, totally pointless. Like, this was completely pointless. It was just to be like, look, Praetorian guards, you know, the ones that the that Hux's dad gave him, they're there. And they, they just make busy work out of him and kill him, and that's it. And then that's the end of the episode. And so, I guess the big space battle for the rubble of Mandalore is next week. And then, I don't know, guys. I mean, this episode had some really stupid stuff, but it wasn't nearly as bad as the previous ones. Not even nearly as bad. The helmet crap still going on is really dumb at this point. Like, dudes, just join together or don't. Like, this is dumb. Take a breath of fresh air. And they could have cut, you know, five episodes worth of content out of the show very easily, and it would have made way more sense and been more interesting. But, you know, you got to drag it out for viewership and for content. Um, and you know, and, 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 and that's the problem with a lot of these episodes. Like look at last week's, like, it's weird that they have last week's absolute tire fire, like didn't fit the, the show at all. It was all like lovely and bright and bright colors and Lizzo and croquet and all of this stupid stuff. And then you do get this episode, which was darker and more Mandalorian and much cooler, you know, like they don't fit together at all. Like the, 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 the season is just kind of all over the place. And, you know, this episode on its own wasn't too bad. Like, it had some stupid stuff, but it wasn't too bad. Um, totally, you know, a watchable episode. It's not like I'm walking away being like, this was the dumbest thing I've ever seen, although there was some stupid stuff. But, like, again, when you tie it in with the rest of the season, it's like, wh wh where was this? Like, wh what were we doing for seven episodes? Or whatever, six episodes. So, and also, Grogu shouldn't be in this season. You know, there's nothing for him to do he's he's problematic it doesn't help the show at all he just he adds nothing other than cuteness and they're doing it because of the people that want to see grogu in the show but it's like it's a much better show with he should stay should have stayed with luke like all he's doing now is 
running around in a kangaroo pouch so IG-11 could be there so they could say, look, it ties into the first episode. You know, it's dumb. And I mean, again, if if he can stop a Rancor and a massive droid and Book of Boba Fett and do all this crazy stuff with the Force, he could have just thrown Gideon and all his guys down, down, down or like smack him against the wall or... He didn't do anything with the Force in the final scene. Why didn't he use the Force to open the blast door right off the bat so Mando wouldn't get taken? Like, he just stands there in the IG suit. Like, that's all he's doing. He's just walking around in a mech suit. And, and in a way, it actually ruins IG-11 because then he doesn't do his normal stuff, which is blasting the crap out of everybody. They could have used him. So actually, it made IG-11 completely useless having Grogu in him because nothing happened with him. He's just there, and then he runs away with everybody else. He doesn't shoot anybody. He doesn't do anything. So... It just confirms him doing nothing, that it's dumb, and that he should have stayed with Luke. And Luke should have allowed him to visit his dad at times and just be training him. Because Luke knows that attachments aren't bad. So the whole thing is just dumbness written on top of dumbness. And it's nonsense due to previous nonsense. So again, guys, not the worst episode ever. It was okay. Uh, Some stupid stuff. I didn't mind it at all. It's totally watchable. Um... But they, they just, mistakes that they're making in the writing and previous stuff is affecting what could have been a much better episode this episode, as I mentioned with Grogu and some other stuff. So, but thanks for, uh, thanks for listening and have a good day.